Okay, guys, so as I mentioned, we talked about uh, a lot of Wisconsin politicians, but there's one in particular that we wanted to spend some serious time on, and that would be Scott Walker. We, uh, you, I know, you know, you, yeah, yeah. You saw at the very beginning him in a video just recorded today and put on his Twitter account, rocking his Packers jersey, talked about all the family members that he has with pre-existing conditions and how he assured all of you that as long as he was in charge, pre-existing conditions would always be covered. Every, well, member, a- every member of my family has the Innsmouth look. Well, it is a personal issue for him because he wants his health insurer to fix those fucked up eyelids. Just reading here from uh, Politico today, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker sought for years to put Medicaid recipients to work. Now federal officials have given him most of what he wanted, but he's delaying the process for fear the changes will doom his flailing re-election bid, say three federal officials familiar with the deliberations. Wisconsin's been stalling, said one official, adding the Trump administration has been ready to formally approve and announce the state's new work requirements for weeks. It's ended up being a lot of hurry up and wait. The Walker administration disputed the government is slow walking the project process, saying the state needs time to iron out the details and blaming delays on the Trump administration. Walker's hesitation to impose strict Medicaid work rules comes as many Republicans have retreated from health care on the campaign trail, and as Democrats hammer the message the GOP is working to strip health care protections from millions of people. And, of course, this is what he's responding to, assuring you that, of course, he will not do that. Yeah, it'll be great. He's going to get reelected, and then the day after his inauguration, he's going to announce Diving for Chemotherapy, the fun new game show where... The higher up you're willing to jump into a pool, the more interferon you get. <laughs> Isn't that it? You know, in, these incompetent Republicans, they run up the deficit and they, they, they lie and they, they don't even pass the Medicaid work requirements that we all want. That's why you need to vote Democratic, because you will get Medicaid opportunity programs where you have to log 80 hours a week on a, on a paid app. In order to get health care. Yeah, I if think you're it's re- nice that he's uh, protecting all those with Romanov blood diseases. Under the Democratic plan, if you're really good at the app TikTok, you get Medicaid. <laughs> Wonderful. So Scott Walker, of course, rose to national prominence for his role in stripping collective bargaining rights from state employees and his recall election and the protest it generated, which played out all right here in Madison, Wisconsin, in your beautiful dome. All under the dome. Scott Walker is basically the perfect politician to be backed by the Koch brothers. He is an utterly gormless moron through which you can pour anything into and he will regurgitate it semi-competently in front of a television camera. He's got this like dumb boyish face and demeanor that is... Truly repellent to me. I don't know how you people deal with it. Because they like some, Scott Walker. Yeah, we have some Scott Walker fans here in the audience. Wait, wait a minute. I don't know. That's understand. the handsomest man in Wisconsin. No, <laughs> Scott Walker's Scott Walker's Instagram is like it's darker than like Instagrams that are just ISIS beheading videos. Like it just <laughs> it, it is it is like an oppressive type of normalness. Like, just the fucking bag lunches of the dry ham he takes to work every day. Yeah. I was just gonna... fucking in unbearable. If, at if... least, like, like, at least other austere Republican politicians, it was like Duke Cunningham. They were doing all this evil shit, so they're like, ooh, I'm going to buy silk pajamas and charm a young lady on my boat. But he's just, like, he's not even getting anything out of it. It's just He's just this fucking wood-faced oaf who's eating dry ham for 35 years. Yeah, if you really, really want to describe and sum up Scott Walker the politician and Scott Walker the person, Felix alluded to it, it's this. With, this is, a, I'm quoting from a news article now. With National Sandwich Day behind us, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker oh. on Friday, apropos of nothing other Felix, than Felix, that's like the goyish Passover. Yeah, that's when they all got let out of Kroger's, even though they got locked in. (laughs) On Friday, apropos of nothing other than the fact it was four hours until lunchtime, Scott Walker shared on Twitter 
that for 26 years, he's eaten two ham and cheese sandwiches nearly every day. Normal man. The expectations maybe include Thanksgiving or his birthday, but it's unclear. Mr. Too Damn Normal. The news was followed up with the statement that, like millions of Americans, I bring my own lunch to work and included a picture of Walker holding mayonnaise. <laughs> but, like, loose in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo- I, love, I love being the chief executive of an incredibly populous state with a big economy and just having the same brain as one of those Labrador retrievers that gets excited to eat the same dry food every day of their life, <laughs> but also just being a, a vicious servant of austerity also. <laughs> Scott Walker. Yeah, he's like... Over 26 he years... He answers the que- answers like, what if your governor looked like a hundred dudes nutted into a jello mold? <laughs> <laughs> I think someone... Go on, Will. Go on. Go off. Sorry, buddy. Sorry. Go off, King. And that's ham, sis. <laughs> <laughs> And Matt, you pointed this out. He, not only does he tweet about his two ham sandwiches every day for 26 years, which is like almost 20,000 ham sandwiches that's consumed so over much the course ham. of a life. That's too much ham. Matt, you told me he also tweets about his wife, Tanette, making him yep. ham for dinner every fucking night. Every, well, no, every Sunday evening, every Sunday after church, he goes, pick it up hot ham and rolls after church. So that means he's having ham sandwiches five lunches a week, and then he's eating hot ham and rolls on Sunday after church. Look, so that I is enjoy. Six, six daily meals of processed pork product. I enjoy. How is his colon not the size of a goddamn to four poster bed? It is. I don't understand. I enjoy a, a, a haram meal. I, being that is that is the, the the food of my people. We're a hog people who eat ourselves. But holy shit, that is so much pork, and I believe him. I believe he. Oh eats no, that he much eats it pork. all. He I eats mean, it all. Felix, like, is there a Jewish punishment for being the least kosher? <laughs> I mean, what could Jews even do to Scott Walker? <laughs> Oh, oh! You you don't get to go to the New York Film Festival, Scott. <laughs> like, you know, there's nothing the Jewish people can take away from Scott Walker I at mean, all. <laughs> oh, Scott, wanna... you're never gonna have a bar mitzvah, buddy. You who can barely read English, you won't <laughs> be able to do any of the Jewish stuff. I, I mean, I, I just I, I really want to underscore this. I have tried to have the same thing for lunch, like maybe three days in a row. And it, like, and honestly, like by the third day, I think I'm going insane. I can't imagine it. Think about, like I said, how utterly gormless and bland and just how like, what a husk you are as a person. If you can literally eat the same two ham and cheese sandwiches every day of your life for 26 years and be like, this is great. I love it. I have literally forced myself to make friends because I slow cooked a pork shoulder and there's too much pork in my fridge to eat by myself. I have invited strangers over to be like, hey, let's be friends. Please, for the love of God, eat this out of my refrigerator. Pork is a very extreme meat. It's delicious. But holy shit, if you eat it every day, all the time, you're actually a sociopath. Islam is the way. Evidence for Scott Walker being a sociopath is contained in his book, which is entirely meant to be like a prelude to his utterly baffling and hilarious fail running for president in 2016. He didn't even get a fucking Trump nickname. That's how pathetically he performed. Yeah, Trump, like, he, Trump didn't even notice him long enough to give him a stupid nickname. You know, Matt... Trump, Matt, Trump thought he was, like, he, like a valet guy or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Matt, your, your Tommy Thompson example is very good, and Scott Walker is another example. Like, this guy, because of what he did to uh, the unions here in Wisconsin and, like, the uh, credibility he got with that, he was, like, the number one guy. He was a guy, he had the Coke backing... 
he was like the perfect mold with which to run like the Paul Ryan agenda yep. in 2016. And it went nowhere. It went nowhere. I mean, Ain't maybe shit. Wisconsin is like the upper limit of what you can accomplish as a ham eating maniac. Yeah. But I, I, now I want to I want to talk about his book. Now, obviously, this was like a promotional thing for his 2016 presidential run. Before he realized there was such a thing as a ham ceiling. <laughs> the book is called Undisputed. Can we put it up there? Oh, oh no, he's un- a big boy, isn't he? Unintimidated. I'm sorry. Unintimidated. Look at the big boy. He's not scared of anybody, is he? That's no, him. Look, he's a big, scary boy. With a tie as wide as the peninsula. That the book, the book opens with him talking about how there was a loud vending machine in the Capitol that used to scare him, but not anymore. <laughs> the one with the, the Coke machine with the robotic arm thing. So the title, like I said, I'm, I'm sorry, not undisputed, unintimidated. And essentially this book was his sort of... Uh, like press packet for how he stood up to the unions and he stood up to all of the protesters here in Madison to uh, pass his horrific reforms to uh, collective bargaining rights. Look at that face. He's not intimidated at all. He can tie all kinds of knots. <laughs> so, and, and one more thing I want to point out. It says, Governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker, a governor's story and a nation's challenge. <laughs> With Mark Thiessen. Now, he couldn't even, like, th- this is one of these things where, like, getting a... This like, is a cousin go- of Tiffany Amber, correct? <laughs> a ghostwriter would be too embarrassing, so it says, with Mark Thiessen. Scott Walker did not write any of this book. He is too dumb to fill out, like, a fucking survey to get, like, a Kmart membership card. This is all Mark Thiessen. He's too dumb to vote in most states. This is all Mark Thiessen. And keep in mind, as I went through this book... T- uh, there's a whole th- there's a whole section about like you know how how we won in Wisconsin how we defeated these people and a big part of it according to him was just his essential decency and respect yes. and you know and and he's not he's not vulgar he doesn't demonize people Mark Thiessen was a former fuck he worked for Jesse Helms before becoming a speechwriter for George W Bush and then Washington Post columnist who throughout the entire Bush years was the single most vociferous defender of torture and waterboarding in those all eight years. If you wanted to get a guy to come on TV or in print, say that literally drowning someone is morally or criminally torture, is not torture, it was Mark Thiessen. That's his fucking ace in the hole for this book. Keep that in mind. Let's go. The introduction to this book is titled, If It Can Happen in Wisconsin, It Can Happen Anywhere. And he means that's a good thing. And this is what's so fucking depressing about reading this book, is it's just, it's an account of how he did what he did and got famous for, got away with it, and guess what? He's right. It is going to happen everywhere. Sorry. It begins... If you are like me, the view from Washington, D.C. these days is pretty grim. Barack Obama has been elected to a second term. Don't worry, Scott. It gets better. (laughs) Obamacare will not be repealed anytime soon. Keep that in mind about that clip we showed you at the beginning. Congress has approved massive tax increases. The national debt is on track to double during Obama's presidency. We are experiencing the worst economic recovery America has ever had. Family income has plummeted, and more than three-quarters of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Over 20 million Americans still cannot find work or have simply given up trying. Even governors of states aren't able to afford an entire chin. (laughs) (laughs) Things may look hopeless in Washington, D.C., but from where I sit in Wisconsin, the view is decidedly more hopeful and optimistic. From the governor's beanbag chair. (laughs) He goes, the question is, why are so many Republican governors and state state legislators winning elections at a time when national Republicans are faring so poorly? The answer, in part, is that while Washington remains locked in endless battles that most Americans don't see as having much impact on their daily lives, Republican leaders at the state level are offering big, bold, 
positive reforms that are relevant to the lives of our citizens. Mm. In Washington, politicians fight over fiscal cliffs, debt limits, and sequesters. In the States, we are focused on improving education, caring for the poor, reforming government, lowering taxes, fixing entitlements, reducing dependency, and creating jobs and opportunity for the unemployed. Wow, that sounds pretty good. Didn't he, did he just say, like, that the fiscal cliff and, like, debt ceilings are, like, just stupid, intangible issues that don't affect people? Because, like, he's right, but he's one of those deficit warriors. Is he, like, which, he's completely given up his premise to talk about how awesome he is for just passing everything in the Alec playbook. He goes here, he talks about, um, you know, how, how he wants to, you know, how all, all, of, all of these deficits and... Uh, Big union contracts and benefits were sending Wisconsin into fiscal ruin. And he proposed... Ah, yes, that's it. The unions. Well, this is the theme of the book. And he, has, he says, he, goes, he proposes, he says, it seems like common sense, right? Well, the union bosses in Washington and Madison didn't see it that way. They understood that our reforms were the leading edge of a national grassroots movement for fiscal reform, a movement that is flying below the radar of the mainstream media, but which holds the hope for a bold conservative resurgence across America. They understood the threat this grassroots movement posed to their entrenched interests, so they decided to fight back, and they made Wisconsin ground zero in their counteroffensive. Ultimately, the unions took their stand in Wisconsin because of the unprecedented nature of our reforms. We did not simply go after the money, the lavish benefits the unions had extorted from taxpayers oh, over the oh, years. Oh, oh, yes. Those lavish We'd, benefits. Those lavish union members oh, with their basic so levels of health care and guaranteed work hours that they can go to their jobs. Those lavish union benefits. We did not simply go after the money. Uh, we dismantled the entire system of corruption and cronyism by which the unions perpetuated their, per <laughs> perpetuated their political power and dictated spending decisions to state and local government. We took the reins of power from the union bosses and put the taxpayers back in charge. <laughs> indeed, madam, indeed. So they threw everything they had at us. They mobilized some 100,000 protesters to take over the Wisconsin state capitol in a sit-in that helped give birth to the Occupy movement. They, yeah. I mean, kind of, like, except that they were slightly better than the Occupy. By the way, was anyone in this audience tonight at those protests? Yes, queen. There's some, there's some good material about you guys later. They transported agitators from Illinois, New York, Nevada, and other states. Outside agitators. Culinary union. <laughs> they banged drums and blasted horns day and night, harassed and spit on lawmakers as they made their way through the Capitol. <laughs> Uh, so many monocles were shattered that day. And turned our historic rotunda into a theater of the absurd. <laughs> Yo, I got a historic rotunda for you right here, baby. By the way, Dude, so were, people were turning into rhinoceroses and other people weren't acknowledging that they were turning into rhinoceroses. Dude, do whatever the fuck you want to me, but do not turn my rotunda into a place of mockery. You do not inject Dadaist concepts of the inherent absurdity of Western culture into my gorgeous rotunda. Dude, if I see Marcel Duchamp, I'm going to kick his fucking ass. No cap. That is a fucking pipe, motherfucker. What else is it? Obviously, it's a pipe. I'll fucking kill you. By the way, it was fascinating to learn that uh, your guy's dome is second only to the U.S. Capitol in terms of the largest theater of absurdity it's in the United States. Glor gorgeous globular absurdity. Many are saying that Wisconsin is the most sus state. Okay. That's, the, that's just the introduction. This is chapter one. Oh. Chapter one is titled, This oh is God. What Democracy Looks Like. Oh, oh he's doing oh irony. Oh nice. God. Oh, good. I love an ironic cool. gentleman. This, we, I, 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 it feels like you've been reading from this for like an hour. Yeah. But like, 
I know you've only read the introduction. This book gives you the feeling. We've all aged 20 years here on this stage. This book gives you the feeling of eating too much ham. Like, it's incredible. (laughs) We're all dealing with ham sweats right now. This is how this chapter, this is how the book begins. I'd like some ham, actually. <laughs> Why? We'll just talking about we'll, it so we'll, much. We'll get some after the show. I'd like, I'd like a nice... Matt, we're, uh, gonna girls get, love ham. I'd like a nice honey bake. Matt, I'm going to get you some ham no, after the show. It's okay. Thank this, you. Is how, this is how this chapter and book begins. Governor, we've lost control of the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, Governor, we've lost control of the Capitol. The call came from my deputy chief of staff, Eric Shutt. <laughs> Amid the chaos, his voice was calm and matter of fact. It was not. Thousands of protesters had overrun the police and were rampaging through the historic Wisconsin State Capitol building. It was March 9th, 2011, and the state Senate had just held a sudden, unexpected vote on our legislation to reform collective bargaining. The move had caught the unions and protesters by surprise. With 14 Democratic senators still hiding out across state lines in Illinois, everyone thought that the Senate could not act. Under our state constitution, a vote on any bill, blah, 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 blah. It was a simple, clean solution. We urged the Senate to do it right away but Republican senators hesitated. They were afraid if they passed collective bargaining provisions alone without the fiscal savings, they would be accused of union bashing. Of course, they were accused of union bashing anyway. And as the weeks went on, while the Senate was wringing its hands, their inaction had given the union bosses time to organize protests and build pressure. In February, first hundreds and then thousands of people began living inside the Capitol building. Every hour, the protesters held a massive rally under the Capitol dome with billhorns, drum circles, bagpipes, and chanting and singing. A bunch of fucking public school teachers from Wisconsin be like, well, you know, we work hard for our money, and they're fucking shitting their pants. It was, Governor, we've lost control. Yeah, we take care of those kids and not all of them get a breakfast. And you know what? I got to say, we deserve a decent wage. They're fucking shitting their pants over that shit. They're like, he's like, I don't like a drum circle either. Uh, no, but, no, it does. But, but, no, like, he's, he's talking about it like he's in the Tet Offensive. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there were, yeah, it's a very the limited roar. number of drum circles. There were four. More like you know, uh, lemon squares than drum circles. Okay, good. The roar of the crowd was nearly constant. The sound sometimes reached more than 105 decibels, louder, <laughs> louder <laughs> than a Packers game at Lambeau Field. <laughs> it literally shook the building. <laughs> the protesters in the Capitol accosted anyone in a suit shoving cameras in their faces and demanding to know who they were. The building was strewn with garbage and empty pizza boxes. It was so (laughs) packed with human bodies, there was no way to move around, much less clean. Check this out, check this out. After a while, the floors became covered with a disgusting film and the odor of unwashed humanity wafted through the hallways. That is, that is one of my favorite conservative Look, tropes. I like my Jean Nate, okay? That is one of my favorite conservative tropes about protesting, though, is that, like, there, there's garbage and how, fil- like, it's just like, you know, when, when the bikers for Trump protested Obama, they didn't, Very tidy people. they didn't litter at all. They just sold their shake and bake meth in an orderly fashion <laughs> and packed up their tri wheeled bikes with a lazy boy on the back of it back into the giant trailers they arrived on. The pl- so he says, unwashed humanity wafted through the hallways. The place smelled like a porta john. Yeah, I no, highly doubt that. You know, what happened is, is that he had forgot that he left a ham sandwich behind the radiator. <laughs> Here's my favorite part. 
When the protesters eventually left, work crews with power washers had to spend days scrubbing the building from floor to ceiling. Shut the fuck up. Here, here, here it is. Here's my favorite part. People were smoking pot inside the Capitol. <laughs> How many of y'all chiefed that lounge in the second largest dome and theater of the absurd in America? Show of hands. It, <sighs> Meet me after the show. This sounds a lot like our last Airbnb review. <laughs> I, just, I, 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 just, I really like the breathlessness of it when it, you can just boil it all down to... I thought that it smelled like doo doo. <laughs> and it's just like it's like he it's like his 9/11 that he smelled the doo doo. There were so many sleeping bags, inflatable mattresses and tents that my staff often joked about how many protest babies there would be in 9 months time. They're like, me and my staff were thinking all the time about how many people were just fucking and sucking <laughs> right on the very beautiful floors that we do our legislating in. Me and my boy, Scott Walker, are going autofocus tonight. Very yeah, cool. You did not want to take a black light to that dome. The, okay, so he's talking about um, the Capitol was quiet as I departed that morning. Since no one was expecting the Senate to act until the following day, and the costs of security were soaring into the millions, at around 3.30 p.m., my secretary of administration, Mike Hoopsk, who, who, <laughs> Sent sure. home 200 or so reserve police officers in the basement of the Capitol. Big mistake. At 4.10 p.m., Mike got an urgent call from Eric Shutt. The Senate's going in at 6 p.m., Eric told him. What the expletive in brackets are you talking about, Mike asked. They're going to pass the bill, Eric explained. Mike's face blanched. Oh, God, I just let the police officers go. As word about what the Senate was doing spread, social media exploded. The unions and their supporters flooded Twitter and Facebook with urgent calls for protesters to rush the Capitol. Standing on the Capitol steps at dusk, Mike Hoops. Yeah, Mike Hoops. He watched, works where I work. Watched as an army of thousands formed on State Street and began marching towards him. Soon they had descended on the building, banging on the doors and windows, chanting, let us in, let us in. The small contingent of Kim Capitol Police was quickly overwhelmed. Protesters ripped, the, <laughs> protesters ripped the hinges off an antique door on State Street entrance and streamed inside. Still standing outside, Mike shut, called the deputy, oops, Chief of Police, no wait, uh, called the deputy, deputy Chief of Police, Dan Blackdeer, to report what he was seeing. We've lost the ground floor. We're dropping back to the first floor, Black Deer told him from inside the besieged Capitol building. This is like public school teacher. Sir, sir, I am visibly ascertaining Pete Seeger style musical ops. <laughs> <laughs> sir, there are banjos coming from both flanks. Sir, they are smoking mid style marijuana. The most powerful kind. <laughs> the protesters ran amok, chanting, this is our house, and this is what democracy looks like. And they began searching for the Republican senators who had dared to defy the will of the unions. <laughs> yes. Eric Shutt and my chief of staff, Keith Gilks. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. Gil made up. Gilix, Gilks, okay. What are these Harry Potter ass Republicans? What the shit? These are just like this is just like the author of reality gave them stupid guy names. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm the sister to the governor, Dan Squeegee. <laughs> the next morning on March 11th, 2011, my legal counsel Brian Hagedorn. <laughs> <Come> All <laughs> right, so waiting Harry for a normal Potter fucking name of this entire goddamn thing. Okay, so that, that's his description of, like, you know, Night of the Living Dead at the uh, Capitol building where they're, like, protesters, are like, their arms are coming through windows, like, Ugh, give us a co union contract. Wait, what happened when they uh, stalked around looking for Republican senators? Several of them were killed and beheaded on television. <laughs> that was pretty fucked up. Yeah, that would have been so cool. 
All right, this is, uh, this is chapter two, which is titled, Go Ahead and Do It. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me. Uh, the original <laughs> title was You Can Do It, Put Your Ass Into It, but they decided it was too blue. No, Go Ahead and Do It was what um, his uh, uh, Republican state senator named uh, Mike crumb shoot <laughs> said as he was put up against the wall right before he was shot by the protesters he said go ahead and do it all you will kill is a man oh there's no way he would be that stoic no Mike Cucci would go out as a warrior I want to read one section where th this is how Scott Waterker describes the public sector he goes in the private sector, when managers downsize, they can assess their operations, decide where people go and are most needed, and choose to retain the best and brightest while letting the least productive workers go. Absolutely. Not in the public sector. Mm -mm. The rules under collective bargaining are as simple as they are inane. If you're the last to be hired, you're the first to be fired, period. That meant if we were forced to hand out random pink slips, we would have to let go of some of our most productive workers. Meanwhile, many of the least productive would be able to hold on to their jobs only because of seniority. That is no way to run anything. I'll be the there last to be fired any... from Chapo, by the way. No, it would actually be me. <laughs> I put in the paperwork to start the company. We'll talk about well, this later. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. Wait, what are we doing? You're getting fired, dude. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. You're fired. Oh. We want lo he goes, we want local communities to keep our streets clean, keep our citizens safe, and give our children the best possible education. Collective bargaining makes those legitimate tasks much harder. Government can't work when unions siphon off taxpayer dollars meant for public works and public schools into excessive and unsustainable benefit packages. Government can't work when local officials are denied the tools the pr their private sector counterparts enjoy to reward good employees and fire bad ones. Folks, government can't work without corvée labor. We will call you up for a few months every year and you'll build monuments to the pharaoh. Yeah, private sector, you got to encourage private sector employment by allowing Foxconn to build a suicide net factory. <laughs> Okay, but what private sector is prevalent in Wisconsin? I have to know. What is it? Culver's? Yeah, well, good fucking luck, you fat fucks. <laughs> Collective bargaining is the enemy of good government. Its supporters call it a right, but the fact, it is not, but the fact is it is not a right enshrined in the U.S. or Wisconsin Constitution. I hope he gets eaten. Honestly, what a fucking ghoul. What a fucking monstrous piece, piece of, of shit. shit. Uh, it all sounds like ad hominem to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a section from chapter four where he describes um, the game that Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels spit to him. My at man a Mitch? At a Republican conference in San Diego that gave him the swag and the drip necessary to take on corrupt union bosses in Wisconsin. He told me to remember that political capital is not something you spend, it's something you invest. And properly yeah. invested, it brings a return. When you make bold reforms and people see that they worked, they will give your next big idea a little more credence. I'm terrified to think what his next big idea will be, by the way. Third, he said, always have that next big idea ready. Never stop reforming. Always, always be, be reforming. reforming. <laughs> always be reforming. Moreover, we if you're constantly terror. innovating, your opponents will constantly be responding. When people disagree or throw rocks, better that they are responding to your agenda rather than setting one for you. So just keep throwing rocks at Scott Walker, please. We need a new terror. All right, I want to get to my favorite part of the book now, which how is, is... How is any of this your favorite part? <laughs> Good God. <laughs> yes, it is all terrible, but this is, this is where Scott gets his comeuppance. Hold on a second. It's the, it's the prank call. You guys remember that? <laughs> this is great. Oh, wait. This is a funny anecdote about his wife, Tanette. It's a Mormon ass name. What the fuck? Yeah, name not is that? a name. It's bullshit it's, name. It sounds like my I name mean, is Amber Frost for real, and that is a bullshit name. 
<laughs> I mean, it sounds like it sounds like someone challenged him and was like, "You don't have a wife, dude. What's your name?" <laughs> uh, uh, Tanette. She's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> the protest frayed her nerves. Oh. One what night, baby? Tanette was downstairs to get something. While she was in the kitchen, I opened the door to our bedroom and saw a bat flying around in the air. <laughs> I yelled to warn her not to come into the room. Okay, but real bitches aren't afraid of bats. That's all I'm going to say. And to ask security to bring up a broom. (laughs) Okay. She did not hear me mention the bat. She was certain that a protester had broken into the house and was trying to kill me. (laughs) I love that she thinks her husband, like... She's as dumb as her husband. She's like, oh, he's asking for the thing you used to beat back a protester, a broom. <laughs> There's a home invader. I'm going to ask our armed security guy <laughs> for a fucking broom. People don't know this, but the Pinkertons all carried brooms to SWAT. The go on, get out of here, Sir Han, Sir Han. You go get. Get. Get, get on out of this ambassador this hotel was, kitchen. This, uh, you go get. get. This fucking idiot thought somebody broke into her house and was like, oh, he, need, he needs, like, yeah, he just needs, like, a spray bottle. Like a Few people know yeah. this, but the Apollo Theater Sandman was based on the Pinkerton Detective Agency. <laughs> How was, dare you? You awful fucking protesters. My precious wife, Tanette, every time we're walking down the street and she sees a large X painted on the ground... She's sure that there's a dangling piano above it <laughs> waiting to crush me. Look, we're all making fun of Tanette, but you have to admit her comedy special is very good. <laughs> <laughs> you redefined comedy, in my opinion. So my husband's the governor. So she said uh, she was certain that a protester had broken into the house and was trying to kill me. She told me afterwards she was thinking, oh, God, they got him. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! It's, it's over. over! It's they over! Got... Where the fuck did they I'm meet? I'm free now. It's <laughs> over. Where the fuck did this couple meet? Like an adult annex for learning how to tie your shoes. <laughs> Let's oh, she reassure my tiny dumb wife. Before she found they... out he was dead, she was already packing a suitcase for her fucking Bahamas cruise that she had. They planned. met in the traditional Wisconsin way of both being lost in a hedge maze. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite part. So he says, oh, my God, they got him. It's over. Tanette actually thought that a protester had attacked me in our own house. It's like he's Tanette calling her stupid. Tanette is dumb as shit. It's you like guys. he's calling her stupid as well. That's how intense it was. This is really funny. How intensely stupid my wife is. And me. At Christmas time in 2011, our staff put together a book with pictures of the most awful signs the protesters had carried, <laughs> comparing me to Hitler and Hosni Mubarak. <laughs> You know, our ally in fucking Egypt until... (laughs) Tanette was horrified at the Halloween party when she accidentally put her thumb in front of me across the room and thought that I had disappeared. (laughs) All right. All right. Here we go. Here's Tanette had a terrible experience when she realized she wasn't actually squashing my head. Moving on from Tanette, this is my favorite chapter. Yes, I have a favorite chapter in this book. It's titled, The Power of Humility... The Burden of Pride. (laughs) (laughs) The morning of the fireside speech, after a week or so of more insistent pleas, my staff had arranged for me to take a call from David Koch, the billionaire industrialist (laughs) who, with his brother Charles, had founded the conservative grassroots grassroots Grassroots. organization. In the same fucking fucking sentence where he says the conservative billionaire and his brother who founded this grassroots organization. That's what grassroots means. A billionaire shows up and puts grass on the roots. Americans for Prosperity. For some reason, I had hesitated taking the call. No, you fucking didn't. As soon as they told you David Koch on line one, you were like, oh boy, and put down your fucking second ham sandwich for the... But there was a a cloud in the shape of Scott Walker eating a ham sandwich next to the desk (laughs) because of how fast he ran to the fucking fucking telephone. So he goes, 
for some reason, I had hesitated taking the call. We were so busy trying to pass the bill. I did not want any distractions from that effort. But my staff finally convinced me by pointing out that Mr. Koch's company owns Georgia Pacific and Green Bay, with which, with more than 2,000 workers, was one of Wisconsin's largest employers. I was told that he was concerned about the impact of the protests on the business climate in the state. Against my better instincts, I took the call. Against what instincts? His, his fear he of He also, it, by it, the way, accidentally admits that he knows nothing about the political economy of the state over which he presides. I but, think his, like, better instinct is, like, you know, honestly, sometimes uh, I don't trust telephones. I don't know how they work. <laughs> is, the, is David Koch inside of it? His instinct, that is, uh, is this David Koch or is this a bat? Or is David Koch a bat type person? Look, if you leave a ceiling fan on while you sleep, will you suffocate? I don't know. I had never spoken with Mr. Koch before, so I didn't know what to expect. Does the telephone steal your voice? <laughs> <laughs> The call started out seeming fairly normal, but eventually <laughs> but eventually, it got odd. At some point, it got uncomfortable, like when he made a lewd comment about Morning Joe co-host Mika Brzezinski. <laughs> it was shortly after he convinced me to nail my scrotum to my table <laughs> that I began to wonder if everything was on the up and up. And I looked for a way to get off the call. After I hung up, I thought nothing more about it. The next morning, my staff came in and told me the caller had not been David Koch at all. Wah, wah. But a prankster named Ian Murphy. Dude, shout out Ian Murphy and the Buffalo Beast, if you remember that. <laughs> Ian Murphy's Ian on Murphy, the only good Irish American. <laughs> Ian Murphy's countdown of the top 50 most loathsome Americans for the Buffalo Beast was honestly one of my huge inspirations for starting Chop House. Absolutely. Uh, the call had been taped and posted online, and now the national media was all over it. Murphy was immediately celebrated by union activists for supposedly exposing my ties to the Koch brothers and prove, exposing proving... what a dumbass I am. And proving that I was doing their bidding... If anything, his call proved the opposite. Ah, that's how it works. Now, keep in mind, when they were going to pass this bill, Scott Walker was not doing any media, national or local, at all. It was a complete... Locked down. It was completely locked down. It was a complete blackout on any media appearances. And then his staff was like, a David Koch-sounding guy on line one. (laughs) And he said, sure. It showed that I had never spoken to David Koch before in my life. I couldn't even recognize the guy's voice. If it had really been, if I had really been doing Coke's bidding, I would have recognized immediately that it was not Coke on the other end of the line. Instead, I spoke to the fake Coke at length. The call made Murphy something of a celebrity, and Democrats later enlisted him to campaign against me and build support for my recall. He was later photographed hobnobbing with some of the Democratic senators who had fled the state. They should have chosen their company more carefully. It emerged that in 2008... Murphy had written a disgusting essay for an alternative paper in Buffalo titled, Fuck the Truce. (laughs) (laughs) I love this guy. We may have to reverse our anti-Irish sentiment on uh, on this podcast just for Ian Murphy. This guy rocks. In which he declared, quote, so 4,000 rubes are dead. (laughs) (laughs) Cry me the tigress. They got what they asked for, and cool robotic limbs, too. As a society, we need to discard our blind deference to military service. There's nothing admirable about volunteering to murder people. Yes, correct. I honestly, we owe this guy royalties, I feel like. This guy fucking rocks. So, Scott Walker has just discovered Ian Murphy is both a good writer and pretty cool dude. He goes, still, I was not as mad at him as I was at myself. Listening to my voice on the recording of the call, my heart sank. I came across as pompous and full of myself. I bragged about my television appearances. We've all had national shows, I told the fake Coke. We were on Hannity last night. I did Good Morning America and the Today Show and all that sort of stuff and was on Morning Joe this morning. We've done Greta Van Stuster and we keep going, our, we keep going to get our message out. Mark Levin last night, and I got to tell you, the response around the country has been phenomenal. 
I guess he w- wasn't having a media blackout. He was only doing Morning Joe and fucking Hannity. But the worst moment came when the prankster asked about whether we'd considered putting agitators in the crowd. What were you thinking about the crowd? Was uh, planting some troublemakers, he said. I did not want to insult Mr. Koch by saying that we would never, we would never do something so stupid. <laughs> so instead I stammered, you know, well, the only problem with that, because we thought about that, he just said that we would never consider it, so he's saying now he's humoring David Koch by saying, well, yeah, we've considered planting agitators in the crowd. The public is not really fond of this. <laughs> the teachers' union did some polling and focus groups, and I think found out that the public turned on them the minute they closed school down for a couple of days. The guys we've got left are largely from out of state, and I keep dismissing it in all my press, conference, press comments, saying, uh, they're mostly from out of state. So he goes, it was a dumb thing to say. The fact is, we never, never considered putting troublemakers in the crowd to discredit the protesters. The unions were doing a good enough job of that on their own with the agitators they were bringing in from outer state. But I had made it seem like we had because I said that we had considered doing that. (laughs) Who had suggested it? How seriously did I consider it? I got through it, but the press conference was one of my toughest days. I felt like an idiot. Sure, I was upset my staff had let the call get through to my office, making me look so silly, but ultimately, I was responsible for how I came across. Only later did I realize that God had a plan for me with that episode. Oh. I knew it was God. It's always God. Folks, you know when you you get a call asking you if you have Prince Albert in a can? Hmm. That's God talking to you. When they Pro- want to know if your refrigerator is running. God, is- God friended Scott. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say, is, is Scott Walker Protestant? Is he, is he a Protestant? Yes, he uh, is. Yeah, he's yeah, Protestant. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, he's Catholic? My, my, my pants fell down, and everyone saw the one long hair on my dick. No, he dick. went to Marquette, but I think... God. He- he went to Marquette, but I think I read... Uh, no, in his, his Wikipedia, it says he was... Yeah, no, he's a, Protestant. He, he was sort of a Marquette, Baptist minister. We'll be partying there after the show tonight. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so it says, in my... So God had a plan for me by getting owned by Ian Murphy from the Buffalo Beast. He was working through Ian. In my office is a devotional book on leadership by John Maxwell that I read for his daily message... The day we learned the call had been a prank, we had been so busy that I never had a chance to pick it up. After my press conference, when I had a moment to catch my breath, I opened the book. The title for that day was The Power of Humility, The Burden of Pride. I looked up and said, I hear you, Lord. God decided to send an emissary down to prove to me that I'm a total fucking moron and dipshit asshole. Here's the last of it. My parents had taught me that the only time you get in trouble in life is when you lose your perspective and stop doing things for the right reasons. That is not a good advice. That's not <laughs> that, true. That is literally the only time you ever get in trouble. That is why that devotion for February 23rd was so important. God was sending me a clear message to not do things for personal glory or fame, like run for president in an <laughs> utterly failed and vainglorious <laughs> attempt. It was a turning point that helped me in my future challenges helped me stay focused on the people I was elected to serve, and reminded me of God's abundant grace and the paramount need to stay humble. Yeah, this motherfucker... All my losses are lessons. Next year's the playoffs. Let's go. That motherfucker spent the entire year of 2015 deep-throating corn dogs in Iowa. (laughs) Fo out of here with that shit. That is Protestant magic, though. Like, just like... Every single thing that happens to you, nothing is embarrassing. Nothing is just reveals no, you're a stupid, shitty person. We're incredibly confident. Yeah, it's just like yeah, you know that you, me falling ass backwards into my mm-hmm. toilet bowl and having mm-hmm. to be removed by the it fire was department. God's plan. This, God's plan. God Himself was teaching me a lesson God's to become plan. the best man I could be. Will that is by far one of the worst things you subjected us to. That was <laughs> that a miserable off. seven hours I, we just I spent on this stage. She was literally devoured. Someone tell Scott Walker that there's a pre- tell him there's a presidential primary in fucking Death Valley, please. <laughs> Here's my hope for Scott Walker. This is my hope for his, his, his end. That he's on a bus after he loses, inshallah, after he loses uh, next month, 
uh, and is uh, kicked out of office, and he has to join the pathetic cadre of public speaking losers with the other ex governors and senators. And he's on a plane with a bunch of them, and they crash into the Pacific. And he makes it onto a deserted island. It's just him and Chris Christie. <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting there trying to start a fire on a totally barren island. And Chris Christie turns to Scott Walker, and all he sees is a piping tray of honey baked ham. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Stephen Avery Christman. You know, Matt, when you talked about him getting on a plane as he leaves office, of course, all I could think about was him crashing into that fucking lake that killed Otis Redding over here. <laughs> so hopefully that'll erase the one beautiful and talented person uh, iced out by a Minis uh, Wisconsin lake yeah. and replace him with Scott Walker. Yeah, get back to even, folks. Come on. Scott, I hope with your clear head and problem-solving abilities, you are thrust into a plane-oriented dispute between Saudi Arabia and the West. <laughs> Somebody tell Scott Walker that what Iowa caucus voters really want to see is when it's raining out, someone who will turn their head to the sky and open their mouth. <laughs> That's humility. Madison, Wisconsin, Barrymore Theater, you guys have been an awesome audience tonight. But before we go, I just want to give two quick shout-outs. First of all, to Ayatsi, the Madison Stagehands and Projectionist Union. Big shout-out to them. And, of course, last but not least, if you enjoyed our introduction video, if you enjoyed the Brainworms video, if you enjoyed the Q video, or generally find our show at all listenable or enjoyable... It is due entirely to the efforts of the good man behind the ones and twos, our producer, Chris Wade. Let's Chris give him a Wade. round of applause. That's a boy. The maestro. Madison, Wisconsin, Barrymore Theater. On behalf of myself, Will Menneker, Virgil, Texas, Felix Peterman, Amber Frost, and Matt Christman, we are Chapo Trap House. Thank you so much, guys. Good night. Oh, and we will be signing books out there if you just give us... 10 minutes or so. Hope to see you then. Madison. Brewers are tied 1-1 in the fifth. Madison, good night. <laughs>